It's now my pleasure to introduce our guest speaker today, Mr. John Sewell. Mr. Sewell was a member of Toronto City Council from 1969 to 1984 and was the mayor of Toronto from 1979 to 1980. He has engaged in politics in Toronto as a community activist, city councillor, journalist, writer, housing administrator, and social entrepreneur. He's authored a dozen books, including most recently, Crisis in Canada's Policing, Why Change is So Hard, and How Can We Get Real Reform in Our Police Forces. He has coordinated the Toronto Police Accountability Coalition for the past 20 years and is a member of Charter City Toronto. He was awarded the Order of Canada in 2005. Given all the questions which have swirled around the best way to fund and use police forces in modern cities, both in terms of their interactions with people of color as well as uh, mental health crises, we thought that here Thank you very much. I'm very pleased to be here and I'm, I want to start by dealing a bit with the situation in Ukraine, which I find very, very disturbing and it, it makes you question the whole idea about the human condition and where we are. And I noticed in the first hymn all these words about our faith not being in vain and, you know, we're fearful lest our faith decline. I mean, all these questions are raised, I think, by the, the horrors they're seeing in, in Ukraine. And um, at the moment, I'm reading the book, the new book by Michael Ignatieff called On Consolation, Finding Solace in Dark Times. And he reviews how a lot of people have dealt with dark periods in their own life or in the world. Um, and he, his first chapter is about the Psalms, about how powerful it is in dealing with all those questions. And I just wanted to read you just a few sentences from his book. He says, it's the, the, the extraordinary capacity of the Psalms to give words to our own doubts, our maddening sense of the inscrutability of the world the absence of justice, the cruelty of fate, and our longing for a world where our experience finds validation and meaning. The very fact that they have saved, they have been saved across thousands of years, recited, copied out, rescued from the flames, affirms that we are not alone in our search to give meaning to the world and to our existence. But we do need faith in human beings and the chain of meanings that we have inherited. And that's the lesson of the Psalms. Um, it, I, I found it's a very helpful book at these times on consolation by Michael Ignatieff. So I just wanted to say that. And now I, it's sort of more mundane, but let's talk about policing in Canada and in Toronto. And the first slide, I, uh, I, next slide, please. But the first want, question I want to deal with is the whole thing about misunderstanding what police do. I think we have a real misunderstanding. We, we, we think that police deal with crime and criminal activity. That's their major activity. Probably not the case. In fact, very little of their activities deals with crime with crime and, and certainly not very, very much with, with violence. Um, and I just wanted to get into some of the data uh, which, which makes this case. Um, first point I wanted to make was about crime in Canada. And I have a lovely chart. <laughs> One of the fascinating things is what has happened to crime in Canada. It has gone down in a very, very significant way. And as you can see, crime in Canada was very high about 20 years ago. And it's gone down considerably since that time. 
the bottom line, the green line, is violent crime. And as you can see, it's very, very small, and it's not changing very much. It's changing marginally, but not very much. But crime generally has significantly decreased in Canada in the last 20 years. Next slide. Statistic Canada has something they call the Crime Severity Index. And what they try and do is measure crime that people are really worried about, not the minor, minor, minor little stuff, the, but the more serious questions of breaking and enterings and, and violence and so forth. And you can see what's happened to the Crime Severity Index. The top line, in terms of adults, 20 years ago, it was 105 severe crimes for every 100,000 people in Canada. And in, in 2018, it had gone down to 75. So a drop of uh, about 25% in serious crimes. And in terms of youth, it's dropped 50% from 105 down to 55. So this idea that crime is rampant in Canada it's simply not true. It's literally decreasing. As to why that's the case, well, people have a number of ideas, um, but in fact, uh, uh, I, I won't go into them. That, that's a, a big, long discussion. But if we can look at that chart one more time, what they do there is that they look at the crime severity index in various kinds of cities. And you can see the highest rate of crime is in Regina, and it goes down and down. And the lowest rate of crime of any large city in Canada is in fact in Toronto. Toronto, the crime rate in Toronto is uh, 53 persons per 100,000. So it's very low. There's only one city in Canada that has a lower crime and that's Quebec City. So we're doing pretty well as a city in terms of crime. The chart on the right looks at the number of police per 100,000 population. And one of the fascinating things is that the number of police per, per, per capita bears very little relationship to the, the, the amount of crime. So in Toronto, we've got 167 officers per 100,000 population. Um, but in, in cities that have more, more uh, officers don't have less crime. Look at Thunder Bay as an example. It's been in the news a lot recently. They've got 190 officers per 100,000, but they've got a lot more crime than Toronto does. So those things don't relate particularly well. And the idea that if we only had more police officers, we'd have less crime doesn't seem to actually be true. Um, and and that's, that's the case. Uh, uh, generally across the country. Next slide. And here's a slide that tells you a bit about what police officers do. There's almost 70,000 police officers in Canada. The number of people who are charged with a crime in Canada every year are about 700,000, which means that each officer in Canada is responsible for charging about 10 people a year, less than one a month. So this notion that the police are out there arresting a lot of people, it's simply not true. They would arrest about one person a month. In Toronto, it's much, much lower than that. Uh, if you look at the figures there, Toronto, there's about 27,000 people charged per year in Toronto with a crime. It's 4,800 officers. So in fact, in Toronto, a police officer can expect to, to charge someone with a crime about once every two months. And of those arrests, only one is a crime of violence. It could be serious violence, like a murder or a sexual assault, but it could be something minor like a bar fight. So I think we have to sort of be clear about our understanding that in fact, at the end of the day, police play some role in dealing with crime, but it's not very much of their activity. They seem to be spending a lot of their time doing other things. 
and this idea that they're the thin blue line protecting us from crime, it's probably not true. That's a misconception on our part. It's a misunderstanding of how the police work. I wanna deal with one other aspect of police activity, which is police patrol work. In the next slide, please. We've often heard that the, the, the more that police are visible in society, the less crime will happen and, and people will feel more secure. Um, and they did a very famous study in Kansas City in the 1970s. And they took three areas, three patrol areas, and uh, they looked at each one in advance of the study. And then one, they decided they would continue normal patrols, such as having a car drive around once every hour. And a second one, they decided that they were going to double the amount of patrols and they would car would drive around once every 30 minutes. And in the third area, they decided they would forget about patrols altogether and only respond to calls for service. The fascinating things about this study, and it's a very famous study, is that they found that, in fact, there was no difference in crime rates in any of the three areas. So patrols didn't seem to have any impact in terms of the, uh, the, the amount of crime that was happening. But more importantly, there was no difference in public perceptions of safety. People didn't feel safer when there were more police officers around. They didn't feel less safe when there were fewer police officers around. So it's, it's put a, I mean, that, that was a real challenge to police. Um, and they began to think of all sorts of new ways of trying to in, encourage um, police officers, such as the, the, the broken windows theory and so forth. But unfortunately, they've never stopped doing patrols. And so in Toronto and in most other police forces in Canada, about two thirds of the officers are spent in patrol. As somebody said, it's driving around, wasting human energy and fossil fuel energy, but it doesn't seem to accomplish very much. Um, and in, in spite of this study, which I say everybody agrees with uh, in, in terms of its conclusion, we haven't been able to get police to rethink this idea of patrol. Um, we have gotten fire departments to rethink it, Fire departments at the beginning of the 20th century used to drive around looking for fires. And then they said, that's a stupid idea. And in fact, now they just respond to calls. And you think, wouldn't it be interesting if we could get the police to actually move in that direction? I think we'd probably be saving a lot of time and a lot of energy. And we'd be getting around an awful lot of boredom that police officers have. Um, I want to talk about uh, police oversight. I'm going to deal with two issues about that. And then I'd like to get into some of the ways that we could think, we could rethink policing in Toronto. So on the next slide, I talk about the Toronto Police Services Board. Toronto's Police Service Board is responsible for managing the police. It consists of seven members. Three members of council, the mayor, Mayor Tory, and councillors Nunciata and Ford. City council has one citizen appointee, who's Jim Hart, and he's been appointed the chair of the, the police board. His interest in policing before he was appointed was minimal, nil. He was a senior manager in the parks department. Uh, but I guess they thought, oh, he's the guy to chair it. And then of course, there are three provincial appointees. This uh, body, the, the Police Services Board, meets publicly every month. It's meeting as an example tomorrow morning. But it turns out to be entirely toothless. It never seems to make any serious change about policing. It listens to the public, but in fact, it says, Thank, thank you very much. We're just continuing on the way we are. And whatever it is the police want to do, they do. And, and I wanted to give you one example of the strip search policy. Um, as you know, police strip search people that they arrest in various times and occasions. 
it's a matter of great court challenges. And there was one court challenge in 2001. Supreme Court of Canada considered a strip search that was done by the Toronto Police Force. And it concluded that strip searches are demeaning and degrading and they're humiliating and the police should only do them rarely. And the, the Supreme Court came out with that decision and it came back to the police board and the police board said, thank you very much. We're just continue on, continuing on as we are now. Our group, the Toronto Police Accountability Coalition has gone to the police board every year since that to say, you've got to reduce the number of searches, strip searches that you do on people. And even though we started doing that right after the Supreme Court decision, the number of strip searches increased until under Chief Bill Blair, 40% of all the people who were arrested were strip searched, 40%, even though it's only about 10% of the people who are arrested have anything to do with drugs or violence of any kind. And then in 2018, the, uh, the Ontario government's police watchdog, the Ontario Office of the Independent Police Review Director did a study comparing the number of strip searches that were done in Toronto with those done by other large police forces, such as the OPP or the Ottawa police or the Kingston police or London police. And they found that while Toronto strip searched 40% of the people arrested, the other police forces on average strip searched 1% of the people arrested. So Toronto was strip searching 40 times more people than the other police forces in Ontario. And the police board got that report and said, thank you very much. We're just continuing on as we are now. It was only after the, the murder of George Floyd in May of, of 2020, that the police board under great pressure, particularly from Black Lives Matter, said, oh, by the way, we're gonna change our strip search policy. And they did. And they adopted what the Supreme Court of Canada had recommended in 2001. It took them 19 years before they made that change. So when I say that the police board is toothless, that's one really useful example. It's very, very discouraging. And a second example is in regard to carding. Carding is a process where police officers stop anybody they want, they're asked their names, they say, what do you got in your pockets? What have you got in your, um, um, uh, in your knapsack? Where are you going? Why are you here? Who are your friends? And they would write all that information down and file it away. And so for a lot of people who are particularly youth, who particularly black youth, who'd never been charged with any crime, the police had a record of them. And as an example, if as various studies have shown, if those youth then applied to be a police officer, they were always pushed away and said, no, you can't do it because we'd have carding information on you. And the first study about carding in Canada was done in Kingston in 2004. And it said that carding discriminates against people who are black and people who are of color. Um, and, and it came up, that study came about because of some horrific event with two young black kids in Kingston. And the police chief apologized. The police association, the police board said, sorry, we just don't believe that data. We don't discriminate against anybody. Everybody knew they did. In Toronto, the Toronto Star decided it would try and get the evidence about what was happening with carding in Toronto. And uh, so it applied to the police board to get that data and the police board said no. And as you can, under the Freedom of Information Act, you can then ask for someone to review that data and, and your request uh, by an arbitrator. The arbitrator said, yes, the police should release that data to the Toronto Star so it can do a study about who has stopped and police. The police board then appealed that decision. No, we don't, we don't wanna give that data. And the appeal court, 
the Superior Court of Justice in Ontario said, no, this data should be revealed. That's what the Freedom of Information Act is about. The police board again appealed to the Court of Appeal. <laughs> and the, the Court of Appeal then released a decision saying, look, at this is what the Freedom of Information Act is all about. It must be released. So it took the Toronto Star two and a half years to actually get that data because the police board didn't want to release it. And of course, once it was released, it was perfectly clear that in fact, carding discriminated against kids. The police board still said, yeah, 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 we're doing nothing, we're doing nothing. And it wasn't until 2016 that the Ontario government intervened and said, we're gonna stop carding in Ontario, period. But the police board, they could have done that. They could have done that in 2010, and they didn't. So the police board is really, really toothless. And sadly, it doesn't seem to come to grips with the issues that it's presented to us. Uh, it's very, very sad. Uh, we need a, a police board that, that's going to be stronger. And I'll, I'll get to that a bit later. And the second body that's very influential in regard to policing is the Toronto Police Association. Toronto Police Association represents the existing and former officers. And it's like a, a union. It bargains for collective agreements. It supports, uh, provides support for legal representation and so forth, all of which is a very good thing. It lobbies very strongly for police. So if, if uh, somebody wants to make some change in policing, it will often oppose it extremely strongly. That happens across the country. Um, after the death of George Floyd, when people talk about defunding police and there was some thought of reducing budgets for police in various cities across Canada, police associations in all those cities really opposed it very, very strongly, very strongly. Um, and many police boards back down, and, and as did city councils. But the other thing the police association does is it attacks anyone who criticizes police. It attacks them very strongly. When I was mayor, um, the police had killed a man called Albert Johnson, a black man who had some mental health issues. And one day there he was in the laneway behind his house and he was yelling. Somebody phoned the police officers, the police came, they chased him into his house, they broke down his door, they shot him to death in front of his daughter. And as the mayor, I spoke out and I said, this is wrong, this should not be happening. We've got to change the way police are dealing with people. Police Association went really after me. Sewell's a cop hater, they said. They, they literally wouldn't deal with the issue. They decided to attack me and they attacked me very strongly. So. When the election, my, my re-election came up in the end of 1980, they made it very, very clear nobody should be voting for Sewell. Um, and I think they had a, a big impact on that election. I, I lost that election to Art Eggleton by literally a vote, a poll. He got 88,000 votes, I got 86,000 votes. And I think it's because the police association really went after me. But it's not just me. They went after Susan Eng when she was the chair of the, the police services board and Alan Heisey when he was the chair. Um, they, they put a, a private detective onto Judy Scro, who when she was a member of the police board um, and they, they made it clear that she was being followed all the time. She's now a, a member of parliament um, and on and on and on. And, they, and they've done it in other places as well. So they're very, uh, I'd call them a malign force when it comes to policing. And it means that many, many politicians are not willing to speak out about policing. On that whole issue of strip searches, as an example, we could never get a single member of council in all those 17 or 18 years to come with us to the police board to say they should reduce the, the number of strip searches. So the police association is a very, very strong body and uh, not in a good cause in my mind. I love the idea that they can represent their members, but the pressure they put on people who talk about policing is unfortunate. So let me get on to some of the changes that, that I think could be made to the police that are pretty straightforward. Um, and I hope that in fact, they, 
they make sense to you. The first is something called pre-charge screening. Pre-charge screening is where the Crown lays charges, not the police. We've got experience about this in Canada. In, in fact, we have pre-charge screening in Quebec and British Columbia and New Brunswick. And what we find is that it substantially reduces the number of charges. Um, in, in Ontario, for instance, about 50% of the charges laid by the police are withdrawn or rejected by the courts. In Quebec, where they have pre-charge screening, it's 10%. And in Toronto, the data is quite overwhelming. More than two thirds of the charges laid by the police are withdrawn or dismissed by the courts. That's an amazing expense for the justice system, for the police, and of course, for those poor individuals who are wrongly charged. And of course, one of the things we know is that if you happen to be black or a person of color, the chance of you being charged by the police are much more significant, four or five times greater than if you're white. So if we put pre-charge screening in place in Ontario or Toronto, what we'd find is a much more efficient system for charging people that's much fairer to people. And if we included a racial lens to it, so that we're making it very clear that we're not being discriminatory against people who are black or indigenous or of color, we can make a very substantial change. So in terms of why we add a racial or a sexual lens, um, as it's clear in, in terms of carding, you are more, more likely to be stopped if you're black than you're white, although we've generally gotten rid of carding in, in Ontario. Um, and th there is a thing called discretionary charges where the police have an option. Well, they can turn a blind eye or they can give a warning or they can, can lay a charge. If you're black or indigenous, your chances of facing a discriminatory charge is at least five times more. This is according to the data of the Ontario Human Rights Commission. You probably want to add a racial, a sexual lens as well. Uh, the amount of sexism in policing is very, very disturbing. You may remember the series that the Globe and Mail published four or five years ago called Unfounded, where they looked at what happened when women would complain about sexual assaults. And it was found that often the police would say, oh, yeah, we just don't believe you. We just don't believe you. Um, and some police forces have actually changed their policies considerably on that now. So in fact, they actually do believe women, but everybody considered that that was just very straightforward sexist. But then if you look at the Murdered and Missing, Missing Women Commission, particularly what happened out in the West Coast, particularly in British Columbia, it's a heartrending report. If you haven't seen it, you might look at it. it. It is absolutely heartrending the way that the police literally didn't care about what had happened to all these women. Very, very frightening. It's very sexist. And then, of course, there's the, the, the report Broken Dreams, Broken Lives. It was done by Mr. Justice Basterash on, the, um, on women in the RCMP. Mr. Justice Basterash was formerly of the Supreme Court of, of Canada. And again, it's a very disturbing report about how police deal with women in the police force. And most, um, most police forces in Canada are facing lawsuits by female officers because of the way they've been discriminated against. So adding a sexual lens to, to um, pre-charge screening as well as a racial lens in fact, will probably be very, very useful about beginning to reform police. And the point I wanna make about pre-charge screening is it's already being done in three other provinces. It works really, really well. We should be doing it here in Ontario. The police board in Toronto should be 
asking the, the provincial government to give it the legislation to do so. We, our, our group has asked the police board to do it and they've just had no interest whatsoever. It's a change that should be made and could be made. Second change I wanna get into is the idea of ending suspension with pay. I'm sure you've heard about this idea that in fact, if you're a police officer and you're charged with a criminal offense or code of conduct offense, you get suspended, but you must be fully paid. That's the legislation in Ontario. The only way you can stop being paid if you're an officer is if you're put in prison. Even if you've been convicted of a federal, uh, an offense and you're under appeal, you still must be paid. Um, and uh, it's really quite extraordinary. One of the reasons that in fact, the, the police can appeal these convictions for such a long time is because they have the support of the police association who, who ha you know, provides them with lawyers and so forth. But the cost of suspension with pay in Toronto is somewhere between 12 and $15 million a year. It's a lot of money and it seems crazy. Any other job, if you do something wrong, you get suspended and you aren't paid. You know, you can, you can challenge that suspension, uh, but in fact, it, it, it's sort of, it, in my opinion, entirely fair. If you do something wrong, sorry, you get dismissed, you aren't paid. In Alberta, the chief is allowed to suspend an officer without pay. Been doing it for five years, works perfectly well. So why can't we do that here in Ontario? Why don't we get the Toronto Police Board to be really pressuring the provincial government to make that change? 12 to 15 million bucks, a lot of money. We could spend that in really, really useful ways. So that's the second change I'd like to see. Third, we have a rule in Toronto that says that after dark, you have to have two officers in a car. Very few police, uh, police forces in North America have that kind of a rule. It was brought in because somebody said, oh, it's not safe for officers to be out after dark alone. But in fact, the data on that is, is simply not available. In Toronto, in the first four months of last year, Toronto received 300,000 calls for service. Only 10,000 of them involved some threat of violence. 97% of them didn't involve violence. You don't need two officers in the car for those calls. The amount of money you'd save because you don't have to hire as many officers would be quite considerable. I, I suggest 30 to $50 million here. Um, you know, maybe, maybe people have other suggestions as what that is, but you'd just be removing that second officer in most police cars. Obviously, if you have a call where is, there is some violence, something very worrisome occurring, you put two officers in the car and send them out. But this would be, again, something that would be very easy to end. The Toronto Police Board has the power to end that policy, and it has decided not to do so. I think the police association thinks they don't want it ended because it would mean they'd have fewer members. You wouldn't need as many police officers. So it's like feather bedding. So that's another change that again would be very straightforward. As I say, it's being done by lots of other police forces in Canada and in North America where they only have one officer in a car for most calls. We could do it here as well. Thank you. The next change I'd like to see is disarming the police. As we know, each officer is a gun, a conducted energy weapon, a taser often they call it, a baton and body armor. But as I've just pointed out, few calls involve violence. There's absolutely no reason why police have to have all this kind of dangerous, dangerous equipment, which often is used for bad purposes. People are killed by it when it shouldn't be. And in fact, the number of times a gun is used by the Toronto Police each year, it's less than 20 times for all the officers in Toronto. They publish that data every year. Um, and, you know, they often say, well, half the time it was used, it was to kill an animal who, who was suffering. 
um, and three or four times it was fired in, in, in mistake. Um, the point is that literally they don't use these guns very often and there's no reason for it, why police officers should have them. And the point is there's lots of other uh, police forces in the world where police are not armed. Um, the Metropolitan Police Force in London is the best example. And they deal with lots of calls involving violence. And in fact, they seem to do, do quite well with them. Um, so I would argue that in fact, we should be disarming the police and the, the only gun should be available to the emergency task force of people who are really trained in how to use them and how not to use them. And the point is that, uh, you know, they're, they're often used. I got the data at the bottom of the screen there. You know, for that 16 year period in Ontario, almost 150 people were killed, shot to death by police in Ontario. That's a change again, that other police forces have made, we could be making it. We could be trying some experiments with it if we wanted, but we should be disarming the police. Just a couple of other changes. One is detasking or defunding police. You've heard a lot about this. People have talked about defunding police. And really what this is about is taking tasks away from the police that could be better done by somebody else. So police respond to mental distress calls. In Toronto, about 30,000 of them a year, where there's somebody in mental distress and the police officer goes, and of course the police are, you know, they, they are trained to command and control, you know, get down, lie down, put your hands in the air, you know, that sort of thing. You say those things to someone who's in a mental crisis and that just drives the person around the bend. And then the police officer doesn't know what to do, pulls out a gun, shoots the person or tasers them or whatever. Used to be that in Toronto, maybe two or three people a year were killed in that position. Now, Toronto seems to have reduced it a bit, but other police force continue to do it. I mean, you know, while we were in that great big melee up in, in uh, Ottawa last week, uh, there's the Calgary police. What do they do? They shot to death a man who was mentally ill on the sidewalks in Calgary. So it's happening all the time. Be better to have somebody else to respond to those calls. Uh, in Toronto, we have something called the Gerstein Center that in fact tries to do that right now. And if we started to strengthen those community agencies so that they who know how to deal with people in mental distress could be making those calls on an emergency basis, it would be much safer for, for those people who are in mental distress and they get better care. The same is probably true for those involved in drug overdoses. No need to send police out to those. No need to send out to police out to those who are homeless or youth. And uh, I mean, I think what's happened is that we've ended up using the police as the default service for these problems, which have nothing to do with policing. And be better if in fact, we, we got rid of them and turned them over to community agencies. We'd save a lot of money because of course, police are paid a lot. The average salary with benefits for a police officer in Toronto is about $130,000 a year. Boy, if a social worker could get half that amount, they'd be pretty happy with that. So we, we'd save money and we'd get better service. So that's what defunding, or as I prefer to call it, detasking police is all about. Toronto City Council has asked that we do that in regard to mental distress calls. In fact, what has happened is that the police in Toronto have increased funding to deal with mental distress calls. So it's gone exactly the wrong way. We should be trying to reduce that money, put it over to community agencies, let them deal with it. And the last thing I wanted to, or there are two other things I want. Police culture. Police culture is very worrisome. It's racist, it's sexist, and it's violent. Um, and the data on that just goes on and on. I've dealt general, a, a bit with the racist and the sexist stuff, the violent stuff. I, I won't deal with it, but it is there. 
And we've got to start to break it. And I think the way we do it is the way we hire police officers. At the moment we hire police officers, they all start at the bottom and work up and they work up through the police force. And if, if they're good police officers, they get appointed to more and more senior positions and so forth. If they bought into the culture, they get appointed. And I mean, imagine if you wanted to work in a hospital as a doctor, that you started at the bottom as an orderly. And then you got up to be an orderly supervisor. And then you got to be a nurse's assistant and then a nurse. And so, and then finally you get appointed to be a doctor. That would be craziness. That's what we do in policing. I don't think we do it in any other organization I can think of, maybe the military, but in any other public or private organization, what they do is they have a job posted saying, here's the person we want, here are the skills we want, um, you know, and then they interview people and hire them. We should be doing that in policing. And in that way, in fact, we can get really good candidates who don't have a lot of police culture put right into them from the day they go into police college to, 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 to move forward. We can also do it by appointing senior managers who come from outside policing. As we know, when you're trying to find a new manager in a, in a large company of some sort, you don't just look at managers in companies like yours. You actually look for people who are good managers who can come in and make change in your company. We should be doing that in policing rather than pointing everybody from below. Just as in Toronto, if you're gonna be the police chief, you have had to work for Toronto for virtually the whole of your career. We should be doing the people from outside. Edmonton is in fact now done that. They have two deputy chiefs who were appointed with no police experience at all. So they're people who can begin to break police culture. We should be making that change. And the last change I wanna talk about it's pretty simple how police spend their time. We don't have good information about literally how they spend their time. We have aggregate information from the, the um, Statistics Canada. And according to that data across the country, police respond to about two calls per shift. Not a lot. Each call might take what? 40 minutes, 30 minutes, an hour. So what are they doing the rest of the time? The last study we did, had done on this was done in the 1970s in the Peel region. And in fact, it was so astounding to police that nobody's agreed to do that study since then. It's a very, very strong study showing that in fact, most of the time, nobody's doing much of anything. We need a study about that. So there are seven changes about what we might do. And let me just conclude by saying that making change in policing is not easy, given all the factors I've mentioned. But we need police board members who are going to be appointed to actually make change. We have to have members who understand what policing is about have some experience about some of the things that are happening in policing and are willing to go and represent the public to make those changes. We need city council members who are willing to address police issues rather than to say, well, we can't get involved in those. Now it's gonna be difficult for, for members of council because they're gonna be attacked by police associations. But if we have members of the public coming forward saying, come on, we gotta make some change, then in fact, I think we can probably do it. And lastly, we need citizens and groups ready to appear before the police board. We've, we've got this example coming up tomorrow. Tomorrow, the Toronto Police Board is going to be dealing with a new policy about artificial intelligence. You may have heard that artificial intelligence in regard to policing is very, very discriminatory. It really does attack people who are Black and Indigenous, all those artificial intelligence programs. And just to give you the example, the police um, service put out a draft policy in November and asked members of the public to comment on it. 
40, 40 members of the public, including our group and a number of other groups responded and said, this policy is not good enough. It's got to be changed. And here are the changes that should be made to it. But tomorrow at the police board, staff is reporting that they want to go ahead with the November policy without really any serious changes. In spite of the fact that all 40 members of the public that responded said, this policy is not good enough. And my worry is that the police board is just going to say, sorry, we're going to agree with staff. We don't care what the public had to say. We need a lot of citizens to say, no, you've got to actually start listening to the public. So there are the three things about how we can make change. It's not going to be easy, but it's something we should do. I've gone on for much longer than I should have, but let me stop there. Thank you very much.